Makoto is in every sense of the word a joke, and he isn't a funny one either. Follow him through his misadventures when he is gifted near godlike powers. After going through his regular mundane day Makoto picked up his father's new fantasy novel and plopped on his bed. At least that's what he thinks he did. However he ends up floating in the cosmic tapestry beyond mortal comprehension where he meets Tsukayomi, an ancient god who reveals that his parents are from another world. Due to various circumstances, his parents have signed a contract handing him over to another world to be entrusted to another world's god. If he doesn't go quietly one of his sisters, Yukiko or Mary, may be taken instead. Makoto agrees to do so under one condition, although Tsukayomi doesn't even let him finish. He promises to delete his internet browser history and dispose of anything that could have gotten him arrested. After handing Tsukayomi a letter to give to his parents the other world's goddess abruptly summons him. However after seeing how unbearably ugly he is the goddess decides to throw him in the middle of god knows where. But as a compromise she gives him the ability to read and understand all the world's languages aside from humans. As Makoto is dropped through a trap door Tsukayomi appears and saves his life. He explains that Makoto is physically more powerful in this world due to his real potential being restrained in the human world, but warns that he can still die. Tsukayomi wishes Makoto luck and with the last of his power drained he disappears. After wandering for three days and nights toward a tall mountain in the distance Makoto starts getting tired and thirsty. There are no single women in his area for miles. When he hears a voice crying out for help he responds to a pig girl being stared down by a ravenous wolf. He kicks right through the wolf causing it to explode in a messy pile of flesh and fur. Makoto calms down the frightened pig girl who introduces herself as Emma. She explains that she is off to sacrifice herself to Shin, a local god, so that the fog over her village may be dispersed. Emma brings Makoto back to her village where the other orcs believe he must be a demihuman because of how ugly he is. When Makoto sees Emma using magic to levitate some dishes, he asks her to show him more. Emma demonstrates how to use a basic fireball spell, which Makoto easily replicates. She and the others believe his level must be incredibly high, but they are all disappointed when they learn he is just level 1. Regardless, Emma offers to teach him some more magic. The next day, Makoto departs with a list of Emma's magic spells, and he leaves a letter promising to do something about Shin. Before entering Shin's mountain, Makoto tests the power of his fireball spell, inadvertently destroying a sacred gate. He also accidentally defeats a few of Shin's supposed disciples, who were only using her name to oppress the orcs. Shin, a giant dragon, manifests itself and attacks Makoto. However, thanks to Tsukayomi giving Makoto some of his power, he dodges the dragon's attacks using Ultra Instinct. He then uses a deadly boxing combo that culminates in the frog punch. At death's door Shin desperately throws Makoto into a cube of illusion to trap him in a mental paradise. Shin is shown a vision of him at the archery club with his crush, Heiskawa. Heiskawa suddenly confesses to him, and with a wet t-shirt on, Makoto finds it difficult to say no. Meanwhile, Shin becomes very interested in Shin's past after discovering that his parents were originally from this world. During his dream sequence, Heiskawa realizes that this imaginary Heiskawa is acting according to his whims and that, in reality, this is all a result of the power Tsukayomi gave him. Heiskawa controls a set space around himself, which allows him to search for hidden items and, more importantly, enhance his fighting abilities. Makoto shatters the dream cube around himself, and Shin submits by rolling on her back with her arms up. Shin offers to forge a pact with Makoto, which will boost their strength. She explains that, after peering into Makoto's past, she has become very interested in him. Makoto starts sweating bullets, just how many of his fantasies and deep desires were seen. Regardless, Makoto agrees to the pact. Shin begins the ritual, but due to Makoto's overwhelming power, she is forced to set the terms at 80, 20. Shin transforms into her human form, clad in authentic Japanese clothes. Shin transforms into a human form due to the terms of the contract the weaker individual must take on their form. It turns out that what she's most interested in are Makoto's memories of historical dramas. That's right, she's a Gotham weeb dragon, the worst kind of dragon. Shin takes Makoto into her demiplane, a separate domain in subspace under her control. What used to be a barren wasteland has transformed into a lush, fertile Shangri-La. After picking some persimmons, Makoto uses his ability to detect the outer edges of Shin's demiplane and learns that the area is nearly as large as a whole country. Makoto muses that the orcs could probably live here. When they return to the real world, Emma is there to warn Makoto not to fight Shin. Makoto has already fought Shin. Shin tosses Emma a few of her scales that fell off during the battle. 
When Emma realizes that she is addressing Shin herself, she passes out. The orc village celebrates the lifting of the fog, and Emma thanks Makoto for his help. Shin speaks to the orc chieftain, who is glad that Makoto has avenged the deaths of their village's daughters. Shin asks if he'd be interested in living in a lush, fertile land. The next day, the entire orc population packs up their belongings to prepare to move into Shin's demiplane. Makoto is extremely against this whole idea, especially since Shin's demiplane might be dangerous. A small version of Shin, a fragment of her being, reassures Makoto that she'll defend them from any threats, although she couldn't even beat a roller coaster height requirement sign. With a wave of her hand, Shin transports the entire village into her demiplane. As the orcs work to rebuild and reshape the area around them Makoto hones his magical abilities, learning that he has the most aptitude for water. Meanwhile Shin watches hours upon hours of historical dramas that were recorded in his mind. Makoto complains about not being able to do anything since Shin has forbidden him from doing grunt work to preserve his image as the leader. He threatens to stop giving her memories to watch but when she accidentally pulls out a memory of an eroge instead. He gives up and lets her do as she wants. Convenienced by the fact that Makoto has to sit still while she watches her dramas, Shin leaves to find materials to make a TV. When Makoto sees a memory of a family photo, he decides to follow in their footsteps by walking the same path they did when they were here. Thus his first goal is to look for a human village. Meanwhile a lone adventurer combats a deadly monster known as the Black Disaster. Makoto encounters a few orcs having trouble clearing a wooded area. Using his new power which he dubs Kai, Makoto easily cuts down a tree and tosses it aside. He then heals the injuries of one of the orcs and they exclaim that he healed them without using any mana. However Makoto discovers that he can't use Kai on himself to heal his wounds. Suddenly Shin arrives carrying an injured dwarf. Not long after the black spider of disaster breaks through the walls of the demiplane. Shin has battled the black spider in the past but was only able to injure it. She chooses not to engage it in battle and she entrusts Makoto with driving it away. Makoto applies Pokemon logic to the situation and deduces that the spider's weakness must be fire. Makoto infuses the air and his sword with fire magic but the spider displays superb regenerative abilities. Despite giving it all he's got the spider keeps coming back for more. Shin gives Makoto the bad news. While normally the black spider leaves after sustaining enough damage, it loves the damage Makoto is dealing so much that it doesn't want to leave. To make matters worse its regenerative powers only improve with each spell Makoto throws at it. The dwarf also adds that not even elder dwarf forged weapons could harm it. Makoto tries firing a volley of fire arrows at it but the black spider recovers quicker than he can dish out damage. It pierces through Makoto's defensive Kai barrier and mortally wounds him. However before the spider can eat him Makoto's adrenaline kicks in and he blows the black spider away with a burst of Kai. He then uses a rotating chain gun of fire bullets to injure the spider just as quickly as it regenerates. For the coup de gras he uses his specialty which is a giant water arrow to blast it away. He then collapses from his injuries shortly after but the spider returns as if it wasn't injured at all. Shin rushes to his side but the spider gets to him first but instead of eating him the spider gushes over how fantastic the battle was and how magnificent the pain felt. Shin gets the spider's attention by kicking it in the face and explains that Makoto has the power necessary to have them both as subcontracts. The black spider of disaster is convinced to assume a human-like form and Shin forges a contract between her and Makoto. When Makoto wakes up the hole in his stomach is gone, but yet another Japanese-inspired girl has joined his ever-growing harem. Makoto wakes up and is understandably upset that he has entered into another contract without his knowledge or consent. The dwarf, a respected elder named Baron, considers Makoto his savior and asks for permission to live within his land. Makoto agrees though Shin enforces a few extra conditions. She gives Baron some of her dragon scales to convince the otherwise stubborn dwarves to follow him back here. Makoto explores outside the demiplane to find traces of his parents. He hopes to find some clues in the nearby village of Zetsuya but Shin recalls him to discuss something very important. She and the spider girl want names. This wasn't important at all. She insists on being given a name so Makoto decides to name Shin Tama which is the name of the most valiant female samurai he knows. A radiant glow washes over Tama revealing that her power scales with the kind of name she receives. That's super important as hell. Makoto names the spider girl Mio with the character for Zero since he views Mio as starting from the bottom to reintegrate into society. The following day an assembly is held in front of a racially diverse crowd to announce Tomo and Mio's new names. In addition they hold a vote to decide how Makoto will be called. 
Due to popular demand and the democratic process Makoto's new title is Young Master. Makoto is against being called such an embarrassing title but when he sees the expectant names of his subjects, Makoto is forced to play along. Makoto meets with the leader of the dwarves called Eld, who remarks that Makoto barely looks human. Eld asks if Makoto was given a mission by the goddess but just remembering her face makes Makoto's blood boil. He denounces ever being associated with her which works out fine for Eld. He and his clan are also at odds with the goddess so they have no problem being under Makoto's banner. Tomo introduces her followers who go by the Mist Lizards, a group of faithful devotees whose highlights are their brilliant blue-green scales. Mio then introduces her followers called the Alk. She explains that they were lost to hunger like her, but after receiving Makoto's essence, his blood and mana, they have returned to their senses. To demonstrate Mio jabs her hand soaked in Makoto's blood into the chest of one of her followers. Makoto swiftly ends the assembly and leaves to do what he originally planned, investigate the human village he saw earlier. He returns to the wasteland and spots a human girl, but when she sees Makoto's face she runs away in fear. Makoto follows her back to her village only for them to treat him like a monster. Makoto is forced to run away when they start firing arrows at him and realizes that they don't understand what he's saying due to the goddess influence. A defeated Makoto returns to the Demoplane and learns that the humans are speaking a language called common. And surprisingly, Emma, Tomo, and even Mio can speak it. The reason Makoto was attacked is because of his face but it isn't his fault. Nakoto is just leaking an absurd amount of mana and miasma that makes him look like a menacing demon. Fortunately Emma says that there is a way to suppress mana so Makoto resolves to study the common language and to be fluent enough to return to the human village. Unfortunately, Makoto is only able to grasp the basics of writing and speaking common. A dwarf smith brings him a ring to contain his mana but it shatters on contact. After another week passes Makoto continues to study common under the patient tutelage of Mio. He is able to display words using a little bit of magic which eases his issues with communication. The dwarf smith returns with a special ring called Dropnir, and this time, it is enough to contain Makoto's massive, throbbing, monstrous magical energy. Makoto, Mio, and Tomo put on disguises to enter the human village of Zetsuya. Makoto poses as the son of a wealthy merchant and they enter through the gates and a hooded girl watches them as they do. Makoto notices that everyone in the village looks nice though Tomo tells him that they just look average. God truly does play favorites. Makoto, Mio, and Tomo enter the Zetsuya Adventurers Guild to sign up but the receptionist was initially suspicious of Makoto and his appearance. Mio and Tomo quickly put her suspicions to rest by threatening her. The receptionist assumes that Makoto must have a merchant's guild card but since he's only pretending to be one, he claims to have lost it. The receptionist says that the only way to get it reissued is to go to Tsaij. When Mio and Tamo overload the level appraisal scrolls of the guild, the receptionist is forced to retrieve even bigger ones. Tamo is at an astonishing level of 1320 while Mio's is an even more impressive 15 -0. Tamo can't believe that some spider deviant is a higher level than her. The pair are given their guild cards and Tomo asks who the next highest ranked adventurer is. She replies that that would be Sophia the Dragonslayer, famed for defeating Lancer. When it is Makoto's turn to get his level appraised he hopes that things have changed since then but things haven't. He's just as low leveled and pathetic as before. The other adventurers observing this don't take kindly to them ruining the delicate balance they've built. When they arrive at an inn, Tomo strong arms the receptionist into lowering the price of their stay by threatening to just destroy the whole inn. As they settle in, Makoto notices that the price of goods and services within the town is absurdly high which is extremely fishy. He asks Tomo to watch their things while he and Mio go out for dinner. He's sensed people following them since they entered town. Later that evening, as assassins converge on the inn, Makoto and Mio encounter a young girl out on the streets. Mio tries to frighten the young girl away, because as much as she hates kids, she hates her time with Makoto being interrupted even more. When she starts crying Makoto decides to bring her back to the inn. Meanwhile a man named Rizu observes them with a crooked smile. At the inn the girl introduces herself as Rinon and explains that her sister mysteriously disappeared a month ago. The darkness of Zetsuya runs deeper than Makoto initially thought. Meanwhile, Tomo brings down a few thieves trying to break into their cart brutally murdering several of them. Thankfully she is able to capture one of the thieves alive. She brings the thief back to the inn and Makoto scolds her for causing an Akira-type situation. To complicate matters further the thief she captured turned out to be a girl. Rinon returns but Makoto encourages her to get some food before sleeping. She shows him a drawing of her missing sister and when Makoto sees who it is he suddenly falls silent. 
Neo returns after eating the thieves that Tomo killed. Nekoto reads the thief's mind and discovers that they have taken Rinon's sister hostage and he tasks Tomo and Mio with rescuing her. Nekoto has a fierce and nasty look in his eyes. He's dead serious. The pair do as they are told. The reason Makoto is so adamant about rescuing Rinon's sister is because she's the spitting image of Heiskawa. Tomo and Mio discuss how intense Makoto was with regards to Rinon's sister. Mio deduces that she must somehow be an acquaintance of his, but Tomo knows for a fact that Makoto has neither friends nor family in this world. She peered into his memories herself. With Dawn about to break Tomo and Mio make haste to their destination. They want to finish this up by the time McDonald starts serving breakfast. The following day Rinon accompanies Makoto to the trader's market. Still, Rinon is incredibly worried about her sister. Rinon's sister, named Toa, is an adventurer trying to pay off her family's debt, but the total cost of it keeps going up. One day after failing to defeat Rizu, Toa tells her to pack her things and escape to Tsaij. Rinon darts through the city with what little money she has left and she overhears that her sister has been captured. However, she ends up running into Rizu who tells her that she'll never be able to escape this town. Toa lies on the dungeon floor her spirit defeated and her body in tatters. She comes from a long line of adventurers, but one day one of her ancestors lost a fight against a demon and they lost their family's heirloom short sword. Toa has been trying to get it back ever since but she has failed at every turn. As the last of her strength slips away she is rescued by Tomo and Mio. Mio breaks through the prison doors using her corrosion but they end up encountering the strongest adventurer in Zetsuya, Mill's Ace. Meanwhile, Makoto and Rinon return after selling the Demiplane fruit for 500 gold. When they arrive at the inn, Rinon abruptly excuses herself and pretends to go home. Makoto activates his investigative Kai and spies on Rinon's meeting with Rizu. When Rizu learns that Makoto has 500 gold in his back pocket, he orders Rinon to steal it promising to release her sister from the dungeons. Rinon is reluctant to steal from someone who was so kind to her but she'd do anything for her sister. Mills is joined by Rizu and a few of his men. It all becomes clear to Tomo, Mills is the real mastermind behind the thieves running amok in town. Rizu recognizes Tomo and Mio and accuses them of faking their levels. He warns them that they might be assigned to take on that monstrous demihuman that was spotted recently. Mills invites the two girls to join them badmouthing the level 1 merchant that they were spotted with. Infuriated Tomo and Mio attack Mills, only for their punches to be stopped by Mills's clay aegis, a mind-bogglingly powerful barrier. Elsewhere Rinon is unable to bring herself to steal from Makoto. When he finds her camped outside the inn she suddenly apologizes to him. Tomo stops holding back. She charges straight into Mills's barrier, shatters it and raises hell. Her punches send his men flying into the walls allowing the other prisoners to escape. Mio slaughters her own fair share of henchmen and when she finds Mills, she slaps him so many times that he'll never be into being slapped again. Tomo also defeats Rizu by showing him a strangely sensual and pleasurable illusion involving snakes entering his body. Tomo and Mio destroy the whole building but they start competing over who killed more people. They end up causing even more damage to the town raising every building within sight, except the into the ground. In the end Rinon and Toa are happily reunited. Back at the inn Toa thanks Makoto for his help in rescuing her. Aside from her hair color Toa truly is the spitting image of Heiskawa. Later, to punish Tomo and Mio for destroying an entire town, he fires an arrow into the air which launches them into the sky. Thanks to the destruction of Zitsuya, Makoto, Mio, Tomo, and a few adventurers whom they rescued are forced to travel to Tsaij. They arrive at a village where they report Zitsuya's destruction. Mio's memory-altering powers have made it so that they were the ones who rescued Zetsuya from rampaging monsters, even though they were the ones who made it into a medieval Chernobyl. Due to Zetsuya being no more they'll have to re-register as adventurers again. Makoto wants to get rid of the mentally unstable Tomo by convincing her that she should be a knight errant so she can raise her level to be better than Mio's. Tomo takes the bait and she leaves. Makoto, Mio, and the other adventurers travel to Tsaij. Mio takes a liking to Toa when she calls her Makoto's lover. When they encounter a few giant bugs along the road, Makoto asks Mio to take care of them. With one wave of her hand fan, the giant bugs are destroyed. Toa asks if she and the others can harvest the materials, and after seeing her huge honkers he lets her. He's still a man in the end. Toa and the others brutally harvest the monster's eyes, which is a sight that Makoto never wanted to see. Towards the end of their journey, 
Toa suggests that his newly founded Kusanoa Trading Company should offer transport services. They encounter a few rare monsters with flawless ruby eyes. Makoto asks Mio to handle it again but she becomes irate when Toa and the others request that she not damage the bug's heads to preserve the rubies. Makoto is forced to fight instead. Using his trusty bow and arrow he snipes down the bugs by their weak points. One of the adventurers is impressed that his bow has a tracking feature. Toa and the others happily harvest the flawless ruby eyes, and they continue into Tsaija town built into the mountainside. Makoto re-registers as an adventurer but he's still a level 1 dropout as expected. He prevents Mio from registering, as it would make Tomo sulk and make him look bad. He picks out an s rank quest from the Rembrandt Trading Guild who are looking for some flawless rubies. What a damn coincidence. Toa is happy to hand over the flawless rubies, but she is a bit sad that their journey together ends here. To cheer her up, Makoto suggests that they have a party to celebrate their journey's end. They use their surprisingly high-tech, futuristic guild cards to keep in touch. Later, Toa brings them to a meat shop where Makoto is ecstatic to see the legendary bone on meat that every manga reader dreams of eating. Makoto digs in with the three new companions he made during the rescue at Setsuya, Luisa, the elf bless gunner, Hazel, the human alchemist, and Ranina, the dwarf earth knight. Impressed with Makoto's strength, Ranina challenges him to an arm wrestling contest. Jesus Christ, she's jacked as hell. Regardless of how much muscle she has, Makoto defeats her by virtue of being the main character. Later, Toa tells Makoto about the job he took for the Rembrandt Trading Company, specifically, the nasty rumors surrounding the group. On the way back, Makoto tells Mio to wait for him at the inn while he retrieves their valuable goods. Apparently, bad things happen to those who take jobs for the Rembrandt Trading Company. Mio eagerly waits at the inn, considering burning one of the beds to force Makoto to sleep with her. But he comes back too soon. He hops into bed without doing anything. Mio regrets not burning the bed sooner. The next day, Makoto and Mio return to the Demiplane, where they reunite with Emma and little Tomo. Emma shows him that the various demihumans under his command are making exceptional progress in building, tilling, and crafting. Several of them have also been assigned to build a large and lavish residence for Makoto, which will also double as their headquarters. However, none of them have heard from Tomo lately, including little Tomo herself. Eld comes running in special running shoes to bring Makoto to the forges, where they have prepared several suits of armor for Makoto. However, Makoto doesn't want any of them, and he instead selects a long trench coat which just happens to be forged by Rugui, the same dwarf who forged Dropnir. Rugui explains that the coat is the clothing form of Dropnir, which also conceals its user's mana by absorbing it so fast that it could just kill him. Makoto puts it on anyway. By willing the coat red, Makoto is able to utilize its mobility features. Later, he meets four Alks, Haruna, Akina, Hokuto, and Minato, who are able to shapeshift. They bring Makoto a variety of foraged goods, among which is an extremely toxic species of mushroom. Mio eats them like they're a spicy snack. The next day, Makoto visits the Rembrandt Trading Company to formally complete his request, but runs into trouble immediately upon arriving. A man arrives at Sides Adventurer's Guild, searching for whoever took on the Rembrandt Trading job. Makoto speaks with Patrick Rembrandt, a representative of the guild. When Makoto reveals that he is only a rank E level 1 adventurer, and that he'd like to establish his own trading guild, Patrick suddenly rebuffs him. Patrick doesn't believe Makoto could have possibly defeated the ruby-eyed monster. Makoto whips out the ruby eyes and plops them on the table. Patrick apologizes for doubting him for a second. He explains that his daughter and wife are afflicted with a terrible disease. Morris, his butler, explains that the level 8 curse was the work of an evil witch doctor and the only treatment is the ambrosia made with ruby eyes. Makoto asks to be present when the medicine is made so that he can have Hazel's help. He then gives Patrick several more eyes, and he, along with the entire Rembrandt household, are incredibly grateful. Patrick hands Makoto a receipt for his troubles and wishes him luck on the Merchant's Guild test. Wait, did you say test? The Merchant's Guild receptionist explains that he'll have to take a series of tests, which include a written, practical, and a lump sum of money to prove he can run a business. Makoto takes one look at the merchant's handbook and asks to take the exam right away. Makoto gets some last-minute studying in when the examiner enters the room to administer the exam. Makoto answers the test in nearly no time at all. The exam is filled with fifth-grade math questions. The examiner is utterly flabbergasted, but he says that the procurement part of the exam is harder. Makoto pulls out a ball and is tasked with retrieving a ride crystal, maze forma, illuminatux, and a howl fang, or items of equal value. 
Makoto gives him the monster parts that Toa and the other adventurers gave him. The examiner has no choice but to pass Makoto with flying colors. Makoto showed up unannounced, took the exam, refused to elaborate further, and left. Meanwhile, Tamo returns to the demiplane, bringing along a huge game crab for a lavish feast. After eating some crab, one of the orcs tells her that Mio is going through Makoto's memories. Makoto rushes to the memory vault, only to be coerced by Emma into helping translate Makoto's memories. Tamo is forced to work alongside Mio, who discovers a rather interesting memory. Makoto visits a local pub for some food and drink, but he doesn't know what any of the drinks taste like. He orders one at random, but it ends up tasting like banana juice, but at the same time, not really. Little Tomo ends the workday for the orcs, and she sneaks a little snack just as Makoto arrives. He joins her. Little Tomo explains that the weather has been temperamental as of late, which may affect Makoto's plans of establishing an illusory city. Because Makoto can't just sell random fruit and items that nobody knows about, he wants to bring in unsuspecting adventurers and send them back to society with their goods. This way, he'll have an easier time selling them. When he hears that Tomo and Mio are making trouble, he hurries to the memory vault. Why is it that when something happens, it's always these two? Makoto eventually learns that the root of the problem is that they are arguing over two pieces of his memory, one is an anime, and the other is a Sunday morning mecha cartoon. Makoto allows them to consume his memories, but only because he doesn't want to deal with this anymore. Makoto, Tamo, and Mio return to Tsaij. In contrast to Makoto's high opinion of Patrick, Tomo finds the Rembrandt Trading Company as a whole incredibly fishy. Tomo and Mio take a bed each and they ask Makoto which bed he'd like to sleep in. Makoto takes the sofa because of course he does. The next day, Makoto meets Hazel and together, they head to the Rembrandt Trading Company. At the same time an adventurer asks to hire as many mercenaries as he can afford. He won't let the Rembrandt Company get away with their schemes any longer. Patrick commands Morris to kill the witch doctor, who never gives in to the interrogation incredibly based. Makoto and Hazel head to the Rembrandt Trading Guild and Hazel is nervous to be doing business for such an esteemed group. Morris leads them to the alchemy lab that they've prepared, and Hazel gets straight to work. Hazel notices that they aren't using ambrosia flowers, and Morris explains that the ruby red eyes serve as a substitute since the insect they come from feeds on ambrosia flowers. Hazel completes the first dose and hands it to Morris. He completes two more doses, but when Morris abruptly returns, Hazel accidentally drops them, forcing Makoto to perform a Tobey Maguire maneuver to catch them before they fall. He makes a mental note to hit Hazel twice on the head when this job is over. Morris brings them to Patrick, who has been badly injured after his wife suddenly went berserk. Hazel muses that she must have been acting that way due to the curse. Patrick recounts that the curse started out as a light fever at first, but she gradually transformed into something unrecognizable. Sunken cheeks, red eyes, and gray skin. His wife has either become a college senior or a fallout ghoul. Nekoto asks to see his wife, promising to restrain her long enough for him to administer the medicine. Nekoto enters the room where the struggle ensued and soaks his cloth in a pool of the shattered medicine. He then goes and visits Patrick's wife, who has transformed into a feral, ghoul-like creature. After a brief struggle, he manages to pin her to the ground, allowing Patrick to administer the medicine. His wife looks like a woman again. Nekoto does the same to one of his daughters, and she goes back to normal. Hazel comes running with another dose of ambrosia, but he amazingly drops that, too. He can't even walk properly. Luckily, Morris snatches it out of the air. When Makoto visits the last daughter, he discovers that she still retains some form of her humanity. Makoto puts her out of her misery by curing her. With the ordeal over, Patrick profusely thanks Makoto and the goddess for their help. Makoto wishes that he hadn't thanked the goddess, though. Makoto reunites with Tomo and Mio, but they are suddenly attacked by a pillar of flame. The two girls obviously survive it. They've gone through worse. The adventurer whistles, signaling over 20 adventurers to step out of the shadows. He invites Tomo and Mio to join their side, and Mio agrees for the price of 10 gold. This is all according to Makoto's plan. He doesn't want a repeat of Zitsuya. Makoto and Tomo are attacked, but Tomo doesn't fight back at first because she wants Makoto to give her the signal, like in those historical dramas she's so fond of. Makoto sighs, kills a man, and gives her the signal but he wants them barely alive. Tomo raises hell and deals some serious damage despite only using her fist and the blunt edge of a sword. The adventurer turns to Mio, but she retorts that she only agreed to stay out of the fight. It doesn't matter if she gets her gold by being paid or looting it from his body. One of them tries to get away, but Makoto slams his face into the ground. 
The last adventurer introduces himself as Lime Latte, the strongest adventurer in Saige. Nekoto calls his name the name of a gross bar drink. Tomo easily disarms Lime and forces him to the ground. However, when she catches a glimpse of his memories, she spares his life. Lime apologizes for putting Patrick's wives and daughters into a deep sleep, but that's a huge leap from the curse that Makoto witnessed. Lime recounts that the Rembrandt Trading Company has been targeting adventurers who displease them, indirectly causing younger and inexperienced adventurers to take on increasingly dangerous jobs and risk their own lives. Lime's acquaintance, the witch doctor, tells him that just the other day, adventurers raised by the local orphanage passed away. He then makes a deal with Lime to put Rembrandt's wife and daughters to sleep to put pressure on him. Lime insists that he only agreed because he was told that the girls would be put to sleep. But when the witch doctor was captured, he must have changed the spell. Nekoto decides to let him go, but not before Mio takes her payment, every single gold coin in Lime's pouch. Mio happily tells Makoto that she's made some sudden income. A few days later, Lime begs for forgiveness from Patrick, who, out of respect for Makoto, chooses to spare his life instead of executing him as Morris suggested. Later, Tomo visits Lime while he watches over the orphanage he was born and raised in. She gifts him a brilliant katana and invites him to work as her personal spy. Lime happily accepts. Tomo has her own agenda while observing Patrick. She learned that he is still a ruthless businessman deep down. Nekoto, Tomo, and Mio return to the demiplane, where Emma tells them that they have a problem that concerns the three of them. Emma explains that the difference in power between them and the foot soldiers is so high that their soldiers have lost heart and confidence. Nekoto decides to speak to the orcs, and he asks Tomo to talk to the mist lizards. Since he knows that Mio's elks are primarily concerned with research and production, she shouldn't have any problems. He asks her to tag along, and you better believe that Mio will say yes. Nekoto eavesdrops on a few orcs and learns that they find it depressing to train against him since he never lets them land any attacks. To make matters worse, they seldom speak to the other races. Mio ignores everything that's going on and is more interested in the fruit she picked nearby. Makoto explains that she's holding a tomato. Tomo reports that the mist lizards have the same mentality as the orcs. The various races seldom communicate with each other out of fear of revealing their tactics. Makoto tries to figure out a way to ease their anxieties, but Tomo already has an idea. She holds a no-holds-barred one versus one tournament, with the strongest representatives for each race battling it out. Agars, representing the orcs, and Liddy, representing the mist lizards, step onto the stage. Liddy makes the first move, but Agars counters him with a powerful barrier, followed up by a fearsome ground slam. Liddy recovers and casts a piercing gale that rips right through Agars' defenses. Liddy attacks while he has the opening, but at the last second, Agars grabs his tail and slams him to the ground. Fatality. Agars wins. Despite both sides fighting their hearts out, Tomo finds their strength lacking. From now on, she announces that once a week, they will be having ranked one-on-one -on -one matches with each other. Those who distinguish themselves will be made soldiers of honor. The orcs and mist lizards are worried these bouts will reveal their tactics, but Tomo retorts that they aren't strong enough to worry about something like that. Makoto is asked to give a few words, and he tells everyone that he sees potential in their strength. Henceforth, he announces that he will increase the number of joint training sessions to increase cooperation. Tomo decrees that this is the beginning of Demiplane Ranking, a system to determine who the strongest warrior of the Demiplane is. The strongest is whoever can secure an Act 47 first. Makoto, Tomo, and Mio return to Tsaige to re-register as adventurers. Tomo is devastated to learn that her level hasn't gone up an inch. The receptionist asks Makoto if he'd be willing to train a successor group to fill in their dangerously low personnel numbers. Since it was Makoto's fault that Tsaige virtually has no adventurers anymore, he agrees. Makoto asks Tomo to train Toa's party to become the new main party of Tsaige. She knows that Toa must bear some resemblance to someone Makoto knew in his past life, so she resolves to strengthen her fast so that Makoto won't worry anymore. Tomo subjects Toa and her party to a Spartan training regimen, minus kicking Persians down wells. A few days pass, and she orders them to defeat a troop of Shadowtails. When they struggle to take them down, Tomo erects a barrier to trap the Shadowtails. She points out several flaws and inefficiencies in their tactics, and as a kind gesture, she shows them how it's done. She instructs Hazel to construct a mud trap enhanced with a paralysis potion. She then has Louise find a safe place to attack, and then she releases the barrier. The shadow tails become immobilized in the mud, allowing Louise to shoot them down with impunity. A few start climbing on top of one another to make it across, which is where Ranana's role as an aggro tank comes in. 
Lastly, Toa sneaks behind the troop and assassinates isolated targets. They employ this strategy to great effect against several Shadow Tails, but their final challenge is upon them. Tomo says that the next den they come across will feature a hundred Shadow Tails, and she expects them to come up with a strategy by tonight. Tomo returns to the guild, fully expecting Toa's party to return triumphant. The receptionist is horrified to learn that she left an inexperienced party in such a dangerous place. It's called Deathwish Road, for Christ's sake. However, she is quickly proven wrong when Toa and her party return, carrying with them the tales of two Shadowtail lords. They are now, without a doubt, the strongest party in Saij. Later, Makoto asks Mio to find some ambrosia flowers for him at Tinarak Forest. He hopes to turn them into ambrosia potions, which will then be his primary product. He visits Patrick to ask for his help in establishing a store, and he happily complies. But Patrick is no idiot, and he knows why Makoto wants to rent a space within one of his stores. The Kingdom of Aeon, which rules over Tsaij, usually asks story owners to cooperate with the kingdom's espionage activities. Makoto doesn't really want to play that game. Patrick offers to introduce him to a friend who lives in a neutral city, but he asks for some time. Meanwhile, a group of humans enter Tinarak Forest, where they are observed by the watchful eyes of two elves. Aqua and Eris kill the entire group of human adventurers for entering their forest. You walked into the wrong neighborhood, fool. Meanwhile, little Tomo brings Makoto to a celebration party thrown in his honor to commemorate the establishment of his trading company in the real world. Public speaking isn't his strong suit, and he'd really rather be home. Mio brings him the food she purchased from Saige, hoping to feed him. But Makoto grabs it with his hand like a feral animal and eats it like that. After Tomo drags Mio away, Haruna arrives with a report on the ambrosia flowers. They were able to pinpoint its location but refrained from harvesting it due to a hostile species in the area. She also shares that her other peers, Akina, Minato, and Hokuto, have all thrown themselves into a variety of useful jobs across the Demiplane. Liddy is also pleased to report that he has defeated Agares at their rematch, and he is currently training under Tomo. Just what the Demiplane needed, more historical drama weeps. Makoto speaks with Baron, who expresses how thankful he is for living in what is essentially paradise, but he is also admittedly curious about the outside world. Makoto assigns him to work at his storefront at Saige. Since he is a dwarf, people will naturally trust him more to make weapons and armor. The orc whom Makoto healed not long ago reveals that he has been assigned to oversee the next illusory city encounter. While Makoto's various subjects clamor for a moment of his time, Mio and Tomo are off to the side, eating together. Mio has an idea of who is guarding the ambrosia flowers at Tinarak Forest, but Tomo tells her to make sure of the details before doing so. Suddenly, they sense Makoto's presence vanish, only to detect him again moments later. They have a terrible feeling. They rush to Makoto's side, who was only practicing his archery. Tomo asks him what he was doing, and he explains that he was just focusing on the target. Tomo explains that what he was doing, clearing his mind into a state of nothingness, was akin to dying and being reborn. He did it so many times that his mana has enlarged at an alarming rate, which has also indirectly expanded the Demiplane. Makoto glances at his drop near rings and realizes that they're already at their limits. Tomo remarks that Makoto's mana levels are already likely at the level of a god, and all because he wanted to copy Hawkeye. She warns that if the goddess catches wind of his existence, she will waste no time in moving to smite him. They'll need extra strong mana compressors moving forward, but this is just a band-aid solution. Tomo will have to come up with something else. Neo leads Makoto home, and Tomo collapses from sheer exhaustion. Who would have thought she'd end up partnering with someone on the level of a god? The next day, Makoto goes shopping in preparation for setting up his shop. When he bumps into a demihuman who looks exactly like him, Makoto finally realizes why people say he looks like one. An escort tries to offer him her services, prompting Tomo and Mio to drag him back to the inn. Both girls are angry at Makoto for trying to pick up a girl, even though they've practically been throwing themselves at him. No more. They're going to do it right here, right now. Makoto flees through a mist gate and returns to the Demiplane. When Emma sees his torn clothes and spiderwebs on his wrists, she understands what happened and offers him some clothes. Makoto gears up with some new drop near rings, courtesy of Rugui. Later, Mio apologizes to Makoto for being forceful the night before. All he asks of her is that she not do that again. He brings Mio with him to Tinarak Forest to investigate the source of ambrosia flowers. When he notices that they are being followed, he asks Mio to take care of them before making a break for the ambrosia garden. When they arrive, Makoto holds Mio's hand so they don't slip on the damp soil. 
Not long after, they encounter Aqua and Eris, the two custodians of the Ambrosia Garden. Neo is beside herself with fury, as her precious moment of holding hands with Makoto lasted just 31 seconds. Negotiations quickly break down when the escort from earlier arrives, declaring that she's here to take all the flowers for herself. Makoto is forced to retreat while defending himself and an angry Mio. Not even a Snickers bar could save her now. Makoto carries Mio away to safety while Eris and Aqua chase them. Tomo contacts Makoto and she is only willing to help once Makoto allows her to pursue her katana forging and rice planting hobbies. Tomo gives him a plan to save both the stray adventurers and to snap Mio out of her trance. Makoto pushes the three adventurers into the illusory city, where they are collected by little Tomo and some orcs. He injures his hand on purpose and allows Mio to clean it. She sucks up Eris's magic preventing her from casting any spells and Makoto shatters their weapons with small embers of fire. Makoto convinces the two girls that he's just a merchant on business, and they agree to show them to their elders. Eris welcomes them to Forest Ogre Village which is usually protected by a barrier that conceals them and the ambrosia flowers. She sarcastically says that they invite suspicious people like them to enter their village all the time. Makoto points out that she attacked them first and she replies that it is what it is. Makoto meets the elders of Forest Ogre Village, who are led by a man named Niljastori. Forest ogres are the ancestors of modern-day elves, but they maintain that they are a separate species entirely. Nadono, Niljastori's son, enters to pay his respects to their guests, but he views Makoto with suspicion. You'd be suspicious too if a masked man entered your home and claimed to be a merchant. After talking to his father about the fallen dragon barrier, he leaves. After what felt like an interrogation, Makoto rejoins Eris and Aqua, who want to introduce him to their master. Their master, Mondo, smashes through the walls because using doors is for wimps. Mondo shakes Makoto's hand, inspects it, and likes what he sees. Mio angrily blasts Mondo out the door. The reason? He held Makoto's hand for one second longer than he did. Eris and Aqua run to check on their master, but Mondo is miraculously alive. He lights a cigarette and silently swears to make Makoto regret ever meeting him. Later, Makoto asks Mio to investigate Mondo and Adono. Mio sinks into her dimensions and spies on them. She learns that Monod seems to be possessed by someone, while Adonis appears to have some connections to the demons. When she returns to Makoto, he asks her to swap with Tamo. During that night's celebrations, Makoto notices Mondo and Adono talking to the side. Suddenly, Mondo chokes Adono into the trunk of a tree, and both of them are consumed by unearthly fire. From their shriveled bodies rises an all-powerful lick. The lick attacks Makoto with a corrosive spell, but Makoto takes a page out of Mio's playbook and absorbs it using black magic. He then turns up the valve, and he ends up absorbing nearly all of the lick's magic. He gives Tomo the signal, and the lick is transported to the Demiplane. The forest ogre elders, seeing all this happen, now know that Makoto is no ordinary merchant. They even went through all the trouble of putting this party together so they could execute him. Tomo steps in, revealing herself as Shin, the greater dragon, and the being responsible for creating a barrier around the village. Niljastori, remembering who she is, orders the other forest ogres to bow their heads. When Tomo tells them of her allegiance to Makoto, her master, they turn white. They interrogate the lick back in the Demiplane, and Makoto becomes curious about the various spells he has at his disposal. He'd like to learn some of them, since the only spells he knows were written by an orc girl. The Lick becomes even more depressed to learn he was beaten by a complete novice. The Lick explains that he has been gathering power to transform himself into a Grant, a superior human species with the ability to travel through worlds. However, he is mistaken. Tomo explains that humans who find rift gates to travel to other worlds and remain there are known as Grants, just like Makoto's parents. However, the chances of surviving a trip through these extra-dimensional portals are frighteningly low. Tomo suggests that they keep the lick around and form a contract. It wouldn't hurt to have his magic expertise on their side. Makoto considers the lick a kindred spirit. Meanwhile, the three adventurers from before scheme to steal the treasures from the nearby storehouse. Hokuto and little Tomo carry a box full of gems to said storehouse, and Hokuto spots a little orc girl running to the bathroom. Makoto forms a contract with the lick, and he transforms into a tall, muscular, and attractive man. Why is Makoto the only one who looks completely mid? Suddenly, a powerful explosion occurs, and Tomo suddenly experiences a piercing pain in her head. She remarks that she was careless. She collapses to the ground, blood oozing from her head. Makoto asks Mio to stop the bleeding while he investigates the site of the crash. The Lick struggles to keep up with Makoto, as he is unaccustomed to a flesh and blood body. 
However, he can still cast healing spells. Makoto discovers a badly injured Hokuto and is afraid that he is dead at first. However, with his healing Kai and the Lick's magic, Hokuto's condition stabilizes. Makoto notices that his mana is condensed in the air. That can't be a good sign. A young orc girl hands him a necklace, which he notices belonged to Hayato, that kind-hearted orc from before. She points him to the origin of the explosion where Makoto discovers several memory fragments. Among them, he senses little Tamo, the orc, and a few adventurers. When he remembers Mio's warnings that a diffused consciousness leads to death, he becomes gravely concerned. He tries touching one of the memory fragments, and he peers into the memory of the female adventurer from before. He learns that the adventurer was responsible for causing him to bump into the demihuman from before. Furthermore, he learns that while trying to make off with some treasures meant for disposal, one of his old drop near rings exploded, killing little Tamo, Hayato, and presumably the adventurers. Nakoto goes insane. The woman regains consciousness on the streets of Tsaij, barely alive, thanks to Clay Aegis. She scrounges together the items she stole but she is soon enveloped by a dark mist. Soon, she'll be wishing that this was just a Stephen King novel. Her fate will be far worse. Makoto steps out of the mist, notably without his mask. To the woman, his face is hideous, and his words are undecipherable. From the bottom of his heart, Makoto wishes that he had killed this woman before. He brings out a short sword that was given to him by Hayato and uses it to cut her arms off. As she begs for mercy on the ground, Makoto silences her by stabbing her in the throat, killing her. Tears roll down his face, and Makoto realizes that this is the first time he's willingly killed a living human being. He goes insane for the second time today. A funeral is held in honor of little Tamo and Hayato. No bodies were left behind by the explosion, so they don't even have anything to bury. Makoto realizes he was naive about the world. Makoto names the Lick Shiki, which means knowledge. He asks Tamo about how he was able to use her power of looking into people's memories. He worries that he's become some sort of dragon, spider, and skeleton lick hybrid. Tomo laughs. She explains that, through practice, masters are able to make use of their servants' powers if they share a deep sense of trust. However, during states of extreme distress or emergency, these abilities can manifest on their own. Mio and Tomo compete over who has the deeper bond with Makoto, which is quickly becoming a tale as old as time. Makoto establishes a special district along the outskirts of the Demiplane's border to ensure that children and real-world adventurers don't meet. He is glad to learn that Hokuto is recovering well, but he doesn't want an incident like this to ever happen again. He asks Haruna to assign Alks to pose as adventurers and gather intelligence in this new district. The dwarves also make drastic improvements to their waste management operations. Afterwards, Makoto visits a close friend of Hayato's, and he apologizes for his short-sightedness. While walking home with Shiki, Makoto tells him that he's made up his mind. Makoto visits Patrick, who tells him that he has finished his preparations with his acquaintance. Makoto is surprised to see that the world map is basically just a map of Japan. But are we really surprised by that? Between the Limia Kingdom and the Gritonia Empire lies the neutral city of Rotsgard Academy. Makoto intends to leave at once while leaving his associates to manage his new store at Saij. As a token of his trust, Makoto shows his true face to Patrick and Morris. They both visibly gag, but Patrick remarks that he still loved his wife even though she looked like a fallout ghoul. Makoto returns to the Demiplane and tells Tomo and Mio that he intends to bring Shiki with him to Rotsgard Academy City. As a former human researcher, Shiki is sure to be a valuable asset, and he definitely won't destroy any cities either. As a parting gift, Makoto gives Tomo memories of swordsmanship and Mio memories of guns. Tomo toys with the idea of inviting new species to their Demiplane, the Forest Ogres. After saying his final farewells, he heads to Rotsgard Academy. However, shortly after arriving, the goddess finds him. A powerful blast strikes the city, transporting Makoto to an arid wasteland. At the same time, Patrick receives word that the human and demon armies are meeting on the battlefield, right near Rotsgard. Talk about bad luck. Tomo and Mio sense that Makoto has disappeared, and Shiki has no idea where he's gone. Makoto is attacked by two adventurers, the blade-wielding Sophia and the short Mitsurigi. When Makoto sees that two of his fingers have been cut off, he grimly admits that they're strong. Stronger than any opponent he's faced thus far. Makoto realizes that they must be doing the goddess's bidding. He tries contacting Tomo, Mio, and Shiki, but they are out of range for his telepathy. He's fighting this fight alone. Makoto tries to communicate with them and learns that he's standing right in the middle of the battlefield between demons and humans. Sophia and Mitsurigi have also defected to the demon's side. 
Nakoto adopts an escape strategy and he shifts to his mobility coat. He summons Flaming Ballisti to cover his escape, and he uses Concealing Kai to run away. However, Mitsurigi summons Crystal Walls to slow him down, and Sophia quickly catches up to him. His barrier is just barely enough to defend against Sophia's attacks, but the status quo is back to zero. Sophia is a little freaked out by Makoto's strange abilities, and Mitsurigi deduces that he must be receiving the blessing of the goddess. Sophia uses a special ring to dispel the blessing, not knowing that the only thing the goddess gave Makoto is to speak to non-human races. With the blessing gone, Makoto can communicate with them in English. Makoto maintains that he has no connection to the goddess, despite a giant, golden pillar summoning him right at the center. Makoto asks them to introduce themselves. Mitsurigi points to Sophia, better known as the Dragon Slayer, and he introduces himself as Mitsurigi, but he's better known by his dragon name, Lancer. Lancer didn't die after all, but he still isn't human. Makoto recognizes their names from the guild in Saij. As they prepare to attack Makoto again, he realizes that they won't listen to reason. Fine by him, he removes one of his drop near rings, causing an unimaginably powerful mana burst that explodes in a radius around him. Sophia and Mitsurigi are blown away. He then brings out an Uchin, a large arrowhead, for use in his specialty, archery. He fires a flaming arrow at them both, which splits up into several heads. Sophia and Mitsurigi are forced to retreat behind the latter's barrier just as Makoto unleashes a water arrow. The explosion kicks up a huge cloud of smoke, which Sophia uses as an opening to attack him from behind. In a last-ditch effort, Makoto uses his Uchin as a melee weapon, and shockingly, it shatters her sword, which indirectly injures Mitsurigi. Without pause, Sophia grabs Makoto tight into her chest, but he shouldn't enjoy it for long. Using Mitsurigi's shards as footholds, she leaps into the sky and leaves him to fall to his death. But he's not out of options. Sophia returns, confident that Makoto is as good as dead. Makoto is not as good as dead. Using the various drop near rings that have been storing his mana as fuel, he unleashes what can only be described as Armageddon. Balls of flame and pillars of water crash around the battlefield, obliterating both the human and demon armies alike. When the smoke finally clears, a large lake has formed due to the effects of Makoto's magic. Sophia's armor has been completely shattered, while Mitsurigi has lost one of his legs. An exhausted Sophia swears to find Makoto and kill him if he isn't dead yet. When Makoto wakes up, he is back in the demiplane, lying next to Tamo and Mio. He's alive, and his wounds are gone. He even got his fingers back. Meanwhile, Patrick receives a letter from his informant, giving a detailed account of what occurred near Fort Stella. Apparently, the catastrophe that occurred there was caused by a mage dressed in red, presumably a hero of the goddess. Makoto recounts his experience with his inner circle. Shiki explains that the goddess likely tried to force him to fight the demons, which is why Sophia and Mitsurigi to attack him. This becomes a lesson for Makoto. He wants to increase the amount of spells he knows at once. Though Mio and Tama want to accompany him, he decides to hold them in reserve. It's better that the goddess doesn't know that they exist. Tamo introduces him to Kamo, a new fragment of herself using a shattered drop near ring as her core. The tragedy that befell the earlier one won't happen again. Tamo teasingly says that Kamo is technically Makoto's daughter with her, which Mio just won't stand for. The forest ogres have been integrated into the demiplane, where they are put through the classic Tamo brand Spartan training regimen. Makoto's illusory city is also a success, with Akina easily attracting young, foolhardy adventurers to look around the town. His store at Saige is also a success. It is run by several of Makoto's demi-human allies. Eris's sarcasm and deadpan nature are just what this store needed. The store showcases their capabilities wonderfully. Baron improves a sword's sharpness, Mio demonstrates it by cutting some durian in the adventurer's cheek, and Eris shows the effectiveness of their healing potions. Aqua even joins in as a poster girl because every store needs a dark-skinned elf GF. Several of Makoto's old acquaintances come and support the store's grand opening, while Patrick playfully laments that he has some new competition. Makoto is hard at work setting up the store from the inside. He later learned that the damage he caused near Fort Stella inflicted countless casualties on both sides, and he had also failed to notice the existence of two other heroes fighting on battlefields currently out of his reach. Later, Makoto sits while overlooking the territory of his demiplane, hoping that his parents can forgive him for doing some side quests first. Emma arrives and tells him that the preparations for the farewell party are complete. Makoto reminisces about the adventures he's had in this other world and how it isn't so bad. But when Tomo and Mio start fighting again, he takes it right back. If the demons don't kill him first, his two closest servants will. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and turn on post notifications so you never miss out on another video.